Oh, right, okay. We're good. We've been talking. So just um, to show you next time. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Milligan. I'm the uh, technical director for the Cordon Bleu Australia. And I'd just like to welcome you all here to Melbourne and to the Moranbutton campus of the Cordon Bleu. So uh, I'd just like to hand you over to uh, Sophie and to Nigel and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening everyone, my name is Sophie Davies and I work for Le Cordon Bleu Professional Learning um, and I'm very excited because Neil's in industry seminar tonight um, is really the beginning of um, Le Cordon Bleu offering professional learning courses online and um, we're very excited to have Neil with us tonight. Neil is a graduate of both the Le Cordon Bleu Master of Gastronomic Tourism and we also have a program that's one week in Paris and one week in Champagne, terrible. Um, and, uh, and that's called the Haute Etude de which is Higher Studies in Taste, Gastronomy and the Arts at the Table, which is a collaboration between Le Cordon Bleu International um, and the University of Rhin champagne ardennes um, Very excited to have Neil with us. Neil is going to be um, facilitating a four-week unit called uh, Contemporary Culinary Arts, Modernist Cuisine. And tonight is just a taste of what Neil um, has been working on researching. Neil uh, looked at gastrophysics and neurogastronomy um, for his industry research project in the master's program and I'm pleased to say we've got some of our current master's students here tonight as well as some of our culinary students. So thank you all very much for coming out on a cold Melbourne night to join us and I really hope you enjoy Neil's presentation. I'll pass over. Uh, I think we uh, just have a photo of you, Neil. Yeah, and if anyone's got, if anyone is interested in joining the four-week um, program with Neil later, it, it will begin uh, Monday, the 10th of September, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Sophie.
Okay, thank you very much for coming. Um, in case you're wondering what that video was about, that is the promotional video for a restaurant in California, in Los Angeles, called Vespertine, which came out in, 19, in uh, 2017, so it's been a year. So, I'm basically, the media release basically read, uh, it is a place of cognitive dissonance that defies categorization, exploring a dimension of cuisine that is neither rooted in tradition nor culture. It is a time that is yet to be and a place that does not exist. It is a spirit that exists between worlds, a place of shadows and whispers. So that's quite impressive, okay? And that probably is at the, uh, the end or the upper end of what I'm going to speak about tonight, which is really around, um, as I click through, gets to the end, is around gastrophysics. So there's some, in, some uh, fairly impressive, um, there we go. There, the there we go, gastrophysics. So we're actually sort of talking about, so I introduced it with Vespertine because this, that's probably the cutting edge of what we're actually going to talk about. But what we're seeing as I go through, it's all about a continuum where chefs and food industries and even home cooks are basically working and are just sort of getting a better feel for everything else that's apart from the food. And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So we actually look about it, you know, one of the things is, uh, can I ask, who's, um, who's a fan of uh, Chef's Table in Netflix? Yeah, everyone knows it? Okay, fantastic, you're in the right presentation then. Um, so that's one of the things that's really sort of projected some of this. It showcases some of the world's leading chefs um, around what they're doing and more importantly, how they're actually doing it. So I'm going to share a little bit of that, of what they're doing, but also the science behind it that they're actually finding. because. I think you'll find, as we talk, instinctively you'll go, yes, I know some of that, um, but I'm curious about why it is what it is. And there's another bit, well, I never realised the significance. So there's an element about a fun um, on there, because we can often prove what the outcome is going to be, but we don't actually know the reason behind it. Um, and one of the reasons is, is that when, when you actually eat, it's a multi-sensory process, the human body, human, uh, the physiology and the psychology is incredibly complex. And we're only now just starting to understand how the senses integrate while we eat and everything else around. So what I wanted to do is touch on that and a little bit of philosophy, but I thought it would be useful to start with a little bit of background and some definitions. So a lot of people will talk about modernist cuisine. I tend to use this term There's a lot in the industry to separate it from what was a, a, probably an overhyped and misunderstood term, which was molecular gastronomy. That was actually a scientific discipline created by, among others, uh, a French chemist called Herve Thies, and was really around understanding the science around cooking processes. But it sort of got hijacked in the media and everything else around. It got the whole process, I think, a little bit of a bad name. If you look at most of the advocates, of the, you know, things like uh, Heston Blumenthal and even uh, Ferrand and Aria, they hated the term. You know, and the term that's probably been adopted, modernist cuisine, but they tend to use what they call techno-emotive cuisine. So it's about creating emotions, but using technology to actually do that. And nicely, as you would have seen, if you're not a, you know, a fan of Chef's Table, is that they don't use those terms at all. If you go into Pellegrino Top 50 and look at Rocco Cocano, if you look at Alinea, they don't use those terms. It's avant-garde. It's progressive. It's modern contemporary. So we finally sort of sucked back and actually now can actually look at uh, and enjoy and learn from the actual, their advancements in culinary techniques. But the one thing I often stress is that these techniques are awesome. They create specific you know, um, outcomes, but they're not magic techniques. They don't make good, bad cooking good. You know? And that's the one that's stress. It's all the cutting edge chefs out there if you talk to any of them, have had a very strong background in what would be teamed conventional, even classic French cuisine that they've been brought up. What they then do is taking that and driving it in a, in a basically in a direction, like with most discoveries in, in terms of colouring in the artistic process, to actually push out the barriers around that. And that's one of the, the things which I think was caused a bit of the overhyping and the disappointing of the term, was that people were just doing it for the sake of doing it. And as we talk, a lot of this entrance is around, it's not manipulating for manipulation's sake, it is to create a story, it's to rise an emotion, it's to draw people into considerations that they wouldn't normally actually consider, but most importantly it's about enhancing an experience and making it fun and enjoyable and memorable. So we then talk in, we have the sensory sciences, you know, so this, this again is a very classically laboratory orientated, which gives us some good insights in what's going on 
to give people sort of um, understanding of, um, you know, is this a strong, how sweet this colour is from the perspective when I eat it and I drink it, what are my reactions to it? Um, but it's, it said it's very controlled um, and it's very laboratory orientated. One of the other new ones that actually came out was uh, through a um, scientist called Gordon Shepard in the US, was neurogastronomy. Now this is a real, an, another cutting edge area, but this again, it's really focused on how the brain works and captures and savors flavors. We actually store our memories of food as almost flavor images in our minds. And the eating process, that cognitive process we go through, will actually retract those. That's why memory is such an important thing. It's when we go in the supermarkets and calls have the baking section at the front, or they bake in house, because they're using those subliminal triggers to actually create an urge or an attraction for something by tapping into these elements. Um, around um, neurogastronomy. But as you can see, again, it's very, it's very focused on there, you know, some of those experiments. So you'll see some MRIs up there, and that's, you know, when they're feeding people their special food or their food, what areas of the brain light up in terms of attraction and repulsion when they use certain, uh, when they taste it, you know, when they smell it and everything else, what part of the brain understands. So it's a very important ingredient sort of on there, but as you can see, it is very, laboratory um, intensive. It's also not natural. You know, so some of these tests, the person's head is actually clamped in a vice, and they basically have food droplets shoved in them. And to clear the palate, they then have artificial spit squirted into their mouths. So illuminating in certain direction, but as you'd agree, a completely unnatural sort of process in there. And that's really what the drive was, is saying, to get a true effect of why people eat the way they do, why they find things enjoyable, we need to induce that and to have it into a, uh, a most natural process. And this is really where gastrophysics came up from. Uh, so in there, so it's gastro from gastronomy and physics from psychophysics on there. And really what, that's the description around it. So the scientific studies are those factors that influence the multi-sensory experience of food. Yeah. And what I actually like to say about this, it's really understanding the role of everything else. Yeah. And what it's also trying to do is say, okay, uh, from that we've got the food on, we've got on the plate, everything else. How important is all the sensory information that we're taking, the ambience of the room, the temperature of the plate, etc.? Um, how important is that in that contribution or on that? What we're actually trying to do there is match the combination of the real world laboratory and some of the research we're sharing is done at research laboratories but it's also been extended into restaurants. And we're trying to pair up the laboratory work with the real world experience of what's happening in the restaurants. Okay, so a quick question on there. Um, any, any, anybody got an idea of why tomato juice in, on long haul flights particularly represents anything up to 30% of the, all the beverages sold outside alcoholic? Because that's the stat, it's actually 27%. So when they look at long haul and everything else, they actually looked, people basically um, aimed and went for tomato juice. They couldn't understand it. So what they did is they had the research. What it actually transpires is under plane conditions, particularly the humidity um, and the noise, dramatically affects your ability to, to taste um, on there. It dampens down the sweets, uh, the sweetnesses. It dampens down your ability to interact with flavoid um, com compounds that actually sort of appreciate. Yeah, the one thing that's actually enhanced in tomato juice, because it's full of it, is anami. So anami is that mouthful of the sense of deliciousness, that fifth sense. You know, and tomato juice is one of those elements that is actually packed through with anami. So people, because they're actually sensory deprived in the environment, particularly because of the noise um, and the humidity um, on there, will actually subconsciously reach out and take a product that actually self-compensates it. When they looked at it, it's an army. If you then want to actually really um, hyper it up as well, there's the Liang pairings or Worcester sauce element, which again is full of unami. It's very sort of packed sort of on there. So that's what they found is that the people that wouldn't actually um, taste it on the ground are actually going to actually take it to the plane. And that, that is a subconscious element. And I don't know if, if you've ever tasted airline food on the ground. Um, you know, I did some work with Gate Gourmet and everything else in versions to what it tastes like um, in the plane. Again, it's highly compensated for that, so it's really, really over-seasoned. 
So traditionally, that's why you give your salts packets, something else around. Um, and that's why one of the reasons said they're now looking to potentially reformulate some of these meals. It's more, you know, you're going to get a higher preference of things like mushrooms in there, which are umami-based things. So that some of the harder Italian cheeses, you know, parmesan, mushrooms is an element in there. All of these flavour-packed ingredients or nami-packed ingredients have started to appear in there. So that's really sort of a little bit of an insight in terms of um, the insight of the multi-sensory element um, and how it sort of impacts. So one of the, the main elements of this is an, uh, an individual called Charles Spence. There he is the, the, there out there. He's actually written a number of books um, around gastrophysics. He didn't term it, but probably if you Google him, look at the research paper, he's probably one of the most heavily um, referenced, quoted, um, and obviously written about advocates. So he's actually a psychologist. He runs the cross-modal laboratory in Oxford. Um, and he's sort of made his name traditionally working with um, food companies um, to actually look at redesigning packaging um, on there, the crunch of the factors, which we'll be talking about later, the touch of the product, all to enhance um, the qualities of that. He's, he did basically a long drawn out project to actually work out what the optimum angle and the design of a Tetra Pak is, so they got the most appealing glug as you poured out the drink from a custard-based drink, like an eggnog drink in there. Um, and his really, you know, component is what he's saying is that he argues that of everything about, uh, about the food, probably about 50% is about the actual food itself. You know, that's the, the rating. Everything else that makes up a pleasant food experience, and that's what we're trying to, to actually gear uh, on there, is everything else. It's the plate, it's the cutlery, it's the seats we're sitting on, it's the carpet, it's the music, it's the ambience. All these will have a greater or lesser effect. And it's just trying to understand that to understand how they integrate and work together. Now, part of the challenge is, is that there is no set fixed rule. You know, these are general principles. There are people that are more sensitive to other things, like the super tasters are so the people that really can't eat coriander because it's so soapy in their mouths. Um, in their, so they have an element, and they have a perception process that's going to be a little bit different. So it's on there. The same as sound will have different elements. So some of the things I'm sharing are more sort of um, really sort of generic components in there that they're actually driving. There's still a lot to find, but there's some really interesting discoveries. So if we actually have a look about this and actually sort of um, work through, because, you know, actually it's not just what's going into a diner's, uh, basically his mouth, it's what's going through their mind that's really important. So what we can actually do is look at a, a number of high-profile places that are actually doing this. So on the left is probably a very over overhyped image. So this is Heston Blumenthal's Sound of the Sea. He actually did this in collaboration with Charles Spence. So this is the dish where it comes with the iPod. Um, as you can see there, and you plug it in, um, and it actually plays music and, it, and enhances it. And that was an experimental dish. It is still the only dish that's still on the menu 20 years after it went on, and it's still probably been copied and emulated. The other one is from a linear, which was the aroma cushion. So those, what they did is that they um, got a plastic bag, and using a vaporizer, they filled it with an aromatic herb mix. This particular one was around nutmeg, and they stabbed it about 30 times, precisely 30 times, with a 0.3 gauge needle. They put it in a linen bag, and then they put the dish on top of it, because they worked out that while you were eating it, that was just enough weight of the dish to compress it and let the aromas come out of the bag while they were actually doing it. And that's this experimentation that did that. And that was all about to create that smell, that create that direct connection. Yeah? And one of the things why it's so important is that your nose, your olfactory system is actually directed directly connected into your brain, into the limbic system. And what they're trying to do is actually just engage not only the way it looks and feels, but that, that memory process that are going on on there. The last one in there is also is about the ambiance as well. So I spent a lot of time working in China. This is a restaurant called The Land Club in Beijing, and it's all around private rooms. So these are two shots of some of their private rooms. So you go and dine in here. You have an isolated dining experience, but they were all different. There were some techno-modern ones, and there were some more classic ones as well. They actually created that ambience. Now, this, it was the same food, but they were aligned. And when I, I ate there a number of times, and it was a different experience, depending where you're in, in the room, um, as you actually let through that. So this is probably one of the more um, extreme ones. This is an example. So Paul Perret, this is in Shanghai. This is a restaurant called Ultraviolet. Okay, so there's only 10 seats in there. So this is a completely, what they call a theatrical or ultra-controlled experience. So this one here is about the British menu. You can tell that because there's a big British flag on the table. It's, but this is not laid, it's actually projected from underneath. 
They also can control it because the, the dish is fish and chips. So in, eat, in order to eat in Britain in fish and chips, you have to have pouring rain and, and rain latching against the windows um, to, to recreate the ideal beach experience. So they've got that in the background. They'll have the sound going. They'll drop the temperature in the room. They'll increase the humidity just to control it. Now, for all this, this is going to cost you 900 US dollars to actually do this. You know, there is a lot of criticism. I haven't personally eaten here, but I did speak to somebody that had. And it's really interesting because people by nature eat together because it's a social process and part of the enjoyment is sociability. This is so focused on the theatrics that the, he said the experience was you're just almost isolated. You're enveloped in all the emotions and you had no sense of the other nine people, which is a really interesting drive where you're, you're trying to take an extreme process, but you're actually breaking down some of the fundamentals of why we as a, a species, why as humans, want to sit down and, and basically eat together. There is another one called Sublimotion, uh, which is in um, York or Ibiza. That currently is the most expensive restaurant in the world. So they take 12 people uh, with a two-year waiting list, I believe now, uh, all for the princely sum of uh, 2,000 euros to actually eat there. Now, these are 18 sort of courses. So this is probably some of the, the top end, but as you can see, that's almost taken to an extreme around that. So if you look at one of those, here's a quote from one of the biggest components around this. So this is from Heston. Yeah, and he's talking about the most important ingredient, which is um, the brain. Yeah? Um, and there's some really fascinating, I mentioned some research going on to regard our senses and the role they're playing um, on that. So some of the things we're actually looking at is the, the color of the plates. Um, on that, red plates will make you eat less. There's something going about an attraction or an avoiding mechanism, that's what they actually found. They also found that the, the type of sound will affect how fresh you believe something to be. Um, and there's a little bit more about that. The touch of a knife or a glass, you will actually ha will have an impact whether you think it's low quality or um, high quality in there. One of the things for classic three-star Michelin restaurants, something else, you know, there is a reason why traditionally they had heavy lead crystal glasses and bowls and cutlery and things. It's all part of the ambiance on there, but there is a psychological impact of actually doing that. You know, salty popcorn tastes sweeter from a red bowl, they found, but a blue one makes it saltier. Um, and the other find under light as well, yellow lights will actually enhance, um, increase your appetite, while other lights like red or blue will actually decrease it. Um, and there's different rays on there, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit that as we go through. Yeah, because what we're actually trying to do, um, and that's what gastrophysics is trying to do and sort of share around this knowledge, is really, it's, not, it's about to maximise the pleasure of the meal at that point in time, but also preserve the memory. You know, people want to basically go back. It's all about, we do things for certain things that are short duration, but it's the impact of the memory we're actually going to take forward that's important. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's two elements are actually sort of playing on that. Um, but what we're also finding is a lot of the stuff that motivates. So I talked about uh, eating food and colours that will affect whether you believe something. So like the popcorn is, I could serve that and people will find it saltier. So I can actually reduce the amount of sodium I put in the product. So what they're finding now, the wider social benefits around this is that some of these techniques can be employed and there's more research going on. How can we change the packaging, the colour, the orientation, how people eat food that can actually have an impactful around life choices, food choices and enjoyability um, and address some of these sort of high fat, high sodium issues that we're actually addressing. Okay. Because when we actually eat food, it's a complex process, why we call it multi-century. It's a complex process of physiological and psychological and physical actions in their own right when we're sort of chewing in there. And that's why it's multi-century. So now I'm going to sort of step through a few. But the reality, to make it a bit simpler, I'm actually going to walk through the senses one at a time, though I hope you appreciate and many in the room appreciate that's not how it actually works. But it's very difficult, particularly on the research, to have control, because it's all about control to actually have a uh, statistic and a viable scientific income. So they have to have a lot of static elements. So they find that they're only looking at one sense at one time. Um, if you actually bring too many variables in there, you create too much noise to really get any definitive results out here. So what they tend to, a lot of these experiments are actually geared around one sense in a particular scenario. But collectively, you can start to triangulate these results and get a sense holistically what's actually going on. So if we start with sight from there, you know, uh, we've got that. So there's a famous quote from Pablo Picasso, the artist. He talks about that. He talks every act of creation is first an act of destruction. Um, and then transitions are painful because, anything that, because it's around breaking away from the sort of the status quo. Um, 
And that's particularly relevant, I think, with a food metaphor, because of all the prep work involved in terms of actually breaking and cutting and slicing and dicing and um, gutting and everything else around. There is, by its very nature, a massively destructive process uh, you're actually sort of going on uh, in there. Um, and you also, you know, basically what is um, almost a bit of a paradox is you do that destruction um, on there to create a product that you've then got to destroy again to actually sort of appreciate it. Like an artwork is great. They finish it, they put it on a wall, it's good to go for a couple of hundred years, a thousand years, whatever it is. Food by its very nature, there's very few food examples where people will just look at it and go, awesome, I'm not going to touch it. The whole purpose of the hedonistic process, the enjoyment, the memory sort of process means I've got, actually got to destroy it again. So I'm actually looking at it. So Seg, uh, Sean Rogg is a food artist. He does some quite wacky things, some stuffed rabbits and, and some squirrels and everything else around. And he came, he came out with really that quote uh, around that sort of almost unique paradox about uh, the philosophical view of food and the fact that we have to actually destroy it to appreciate it. Um, but also from a gastrophysics point of view, there is another sort of constructive process, another part basically of food, of creation process that is often, they can start and they can actually construct. So it's not only I have a dish and I'll eat it, but what I, I can construct and present a dish in a specific way that I can make it reveal in a modular fashion. I can actually make the whole thing. I don't know what I'm eating um, on there. What is it? Where is it? What are those flavors, everything else around? What is the, the, the element? But effectively, it does all start with a process of um, you know, visual. You know, we're going to eat with our eyes. So what do we actually mean by this? Uh, just move that. Yep. So really, when it comes to foods, you know, intrinsically we have massive attractions, um, and we actually have aversions. So if we look at attractions. You know, primitive paleo uh, Paleolithic man will actually look at a piece of fruit. Fruit is red, is ripe, it's sugar. Sugar is food. Sugar is survival. Eat the ripe fruit. So it's in that. That's a very genetic thing that carries forward, and it's run right. You know, um, on that process, and everyone's. Um, particularly, um, whether they sort of appreciate it or not, but it's a standard process that goes through um, on there. But what happens about aversions? So in there, there are, if we're eating with our eyes, there are particular colours that we'll be attracted to, but mainly also there's going to be some colours that we are automatically um, averse to, and blue is one of those. So this Emma Bombach, if you don't know, is an American humorist who's no longer alive, but she sort of came out with that sort of jokey food about navy blue flu, uh, navy blue food. For those who don't know, this guy is a UK British famous director called Arthur um, Hitchcock, who came out with a whole series of very famous thrillers and horror films like The Birds of Marnie and everything else. He was also an incredible prankster. He loved playing practical jokes on people, and one of his one was that he was famous for holding blue dinner parties just for the sheer hell of irritating all his guests. And because he was very influential in Hollywood, they would all turn up. You know, so you were there and you would have a brown roll and you basically you would open it and it would be blue inside and you'd have thick blue soup and you would have blue trout. Um, and, also, and then you would also serve blue chicken only for the aversive, repulsive effect it would have on these guests because he was that sort of guy. Um, have you ever wondered what a blue chicken looks like? <laughs> That's a blue chicken. Yep. Okay. So as you can see, instinctively you all went, oh my God, it's blue. Yeah. Um, the trouble for that, you know, it's so instinctive you know, we can actually have some very significant effects around it. Yep. So that photograph here, I'll just go back. But that's, um, so these photographs here were actually created by a, um, a Californian uh, photographer called, um, I know his name's here, uh, Laurie Brown. Um, and she photographed it. She consciously did this. Um, one of the things why she did this was she got really concerned about the number of additives that were going in and then turned the natural colours into products and stuff. So she thought she would actually exaggerate some, as you can see here, the green spaghetti, you saw the blue chicken, um, the orange cheese, the blue little crackers and everything else around. But, you know, so she was driving it, but I used these pictures and sort of stuff because I just want to highlight the sort of the importance of the visual cues and the instinctive reaction that good or bad food, the manufacturers, um, will actually take. And the manufacturers know this, um, and they'll try and compensate. So uh, a very classic example for those who know, most butter, if you actually make it, is not the butter color that you get. It's very pale normally, the fresher the milk. So the manufacturers will add yellow from a NATO, it's a natural, natural product, to make it in their minds more appealing, because now 
people actually believe butter should be yellow, and if they don't, the same for salmon. Salmon naturally, particularly wild salmon, is not pink, but they will add pink to it because people associate that, oh, that doesn't look right because it's not pink, or that butter doesn't look right because it's, it's actually white, not yellow. Um, on there. And that actually does work, so most people accept that. There have been a number, so I don't know, does anyone remember Crystal Pepsi? That thing from the 90s that came out? Yeah, it was, a, it was actually a clear colour, and they thought they would do a breakaway thing. Um, complete flop, because everyone hated it, because they saw clear, and then they, instinctively, clear can't be Coke, because Coke is brown, for a start. So they automatically assumed it was actually lime and soda and everything else around, even though it was Coke. So it completely bombed out in terms of that. So if you start to mess around with people's sort of uh, visual cues from there, um, that you can actually get a negative effect um, from, from that perspective. Right, so what we're actually sort of talk about is why we actually have this reaction. Yeah, um, and it's maybe because it's attributed to, uh, as I said, this in instinctual aversion to certain colours. So we talked about red, ripe food, sugar, energy, green, sour taste, and blue typically uh, in the world. There's very few foods out there that are naturally blue. Um, the French sort of hit the market with some of the new and the British with st still cheeses, but even today, for many, that's actually acquired taste. Uh, so bent people by their natural interaction will actually be averse from that. From that. Um, and therefore, we will have an expectation that the food will not be very good for us or it actually won't be, won't be nice. Okay? So that's some examples of it. So what I want to do now is just talk about what's the actual science behind it. So here that you can hopefully read is a breakdown of a number of key elements. So on the left-hand side, it's basically the number of sensors that your brains have and everything else around. But the ones I really want to get to is, as you can see down the left, we have those senses, vision, audition, everything else around. Then we have the attentional capture. We also have the percentage of the neocortex. So as you can see, what, they have, you know, what that's saying is that you know, if you see anything through vision or hear, basically that will trigger attentionally on there. So that, uh, up to 90% of everything that's going on in terms of your sense. So that's what you're going to react to the fastest. So as you can imagine, that is a very primeval fight or flight trigger. I see something, I hear something, I want to react, and I basically go um, on there. Most importantly, as you can see, of that being that 55, your brain's processing power is actually allocating over half of everything that goes in your brain, the brain and neocortex is, is going towards the, uh, the actual vision. And that's why the, these visionary cues and stuff are so prominent, so instinctive, because your brain is hardwired to actually spend half its time processing uh, visual cues um, on that. And as you go down, you can go sort of taste and everything else around. Probably the most little one is probably taste. That's on the basis that, you know, caveman didn't survive by waiting to lick something before he detected whether it was good or bad. He would look or hear and sort of stuff before he did the bolt. Um, but it's not necessarily all around the relevant... Um, importance of those because some of those sensors are very, very important, if not higher important in some of the sensory clues that we have. But it's, uh, you know, so they feel and, and the research turns, it's a, it's a survival complex that's basically sort of sent in. Like touch, or t touch is there is only 4%, but it's very persistent, it's very low. You tend to respond to touch much more slowly than you would a visual stimulant and stuff, but it still is quite lingering. Um, on there, you know, the, the haptic senses uh, on their own basically develop a, a memory layer and sort of stuff that can actually be far lingering than sight because your brain is processing so much in there, it can't actually create a lingering memory. You can't remember everything that you see. Um, you just don't have the, the neocortex um, and the capacity to do that. Um, but what we're actually trying to say through this process is that we're actually trying to create a perception. And we're going to take all these external cues. Um, and some of those perceptions are going to trigger memories, and those memories are going to be based on some cultural orientations um, on them. What we actually found is one of the studies they actually did is that they gave about 70% of participants uh, a green colored drink and said, what color is this um, on that? And 69%, 70% of them said it's lime because they actually associate green must be lime, um, you, the visual cues. So, Talk about it a little later, but there are certain associations where you look at it, you will make that flavour connection automatically. Chefs for centuries have been playing around with this. Um, but some of those associations are drawn out from childhood, um, and they're, they're, they're basically sort of found. Um, there was an example um, on there where they did this research in uh, UK, they gave this green dessert, everyone said, oh, that must be minty before they tasted it. So they marketed it such that, tried to do the same thing in Japan, bombed out because for Japanese people, 
Green doesn't mean mints, it means mature green tea. It's very bitter. They're, they're looking for a product that's got astringency. So even those rules apply, you've got to be sensitive to the cultural orientation because some of these, and this is a concept they call anchoring. Um, so as we grow up from, uh, from the very young days, through parental control, through our own experiences, we will start to have associations that we will anchor um, and they will form these sort of perception um, groups that we'll actually go for. Now one of the, the elements around this is that they're not necessarily fixed. So we can have a perception and they can actually be changed. Uh, and that perception can change on the fly. It can be permanent, it can flip backwards and forwards. Yeah. So what the scientists do is actually call this what they call a bistable sort of precepts. Um, because your senses, you'll look at something and you'll go, is it this or is it that? Is it this? Is it that? And you'll flip backwards and forwards. So how does this look like? Um, so we've got something here. So we'll start with this one. This is the Necker cube you might have seen. So this was um, a geologist called um, Ernest Necker, 1932. He created the Necker cube. So if you look at it, you might have seen it. Are you seeing two images? It's either pointing to you or pointing away from you. And it's flicking backwards and forwards. Yep, that's that bistable precept. And your brain will do that every two or three seconds. There's loads of these out, you'll see. There's the two, there's the, jar, the kissing vase and the face. And, and this is the concept of actually doing that. Your brain is actually altering, is it this, is it that, is it that, basically on backwards and forwards. And it's changing our perceptions, what it will actually be. So if you look at another one, and I try to come up with the culinary one, because there was the martini and the olive and the, the other one I've done. So if you look to the left, do you see some sort of cute little dog? And if you look to the right, do you see some sort of goofy French guy with a French chef's hat, with a big nose? <laughs> Okay? Flip, 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 yeah? Okay? Yep. So this is great. So this is what they call high level. So if you look in uh, Greek philosophy and everybody else, he talks in the Aristelian uh, philosophy and everybody else, they talk about these higher, more renowned in senses. So this is what we see and this is what we hear and everything else. And the lower senses basically is what we touch and what we eat and everything else around. Um, and these are some of the, you know, um, some of the visual cues. So they're saying, well, if we do this, naturally through sight, can I actually use some of these more chemical senses through these lower ones to actually uh, create that bistable phenomenon that we're actually talking about? Um, and the answer to that is maybe. So here's a couple of examples that have actually been done. So for those that might be aware, this again, um, I did not that I claim to it, but I did a little work with the, black, uh, blue, the fat duck and everything else around. And this is, I saw this being made, and this is the beetroot and orange jelly that you might see. So they'll come and prepare it, very famous dish, you know, he, they'll go and go, two bits of jelly, one is orange, yeah, or I think one is grapefruit and one is beetroot um, on there, and then they basically go and ask you to taste each side. Uh, the trick around this is that obviously the dark one is a blood orange, um, and the other one is a golden beetroot. So you actually eat it thinking this, um, and your mind, so you'll start something and you, you'll basically flip over, and, answer, and they start initially eat it with your eyes closed, and then open them, and everyone goes, oh, God, I thought I was eating the orange. No, nope, you're actually eating the blood orange and sort of stuff. So this was a process that's going on, and they call it sensory incongruency, is where you're actually looking at something, you use the visual cortex to create a perception, and what the chef's doing is playing with that a little bit, because he's tricking you, and to, to basically flip it around. Now, the nice thing about sensory incongruity, there's a, there's a modicum you can do. You can sort of stretch it out a little bit, and everyone goes, oh, that's really, really clever. You can take it too far, and it basically blows out big time. Um, you just can't, you have this concept, there's a cognitive barrier that comes up that just won't allow you to come back into the comfort zone, like, oh, that's really cool, that's funny, I really enjoy that. It just, it goes into the sort of the anxiety or what they call the unacceptable uh, component of uh, eating. So here's another one you'll actually see. So this is a chef, Swiss chef, he's a three-star Michelin guy. This is called by uh, Dennis Martin, and he calls this invisible soup, because it's called Rien, he calls it Rien, it's served. And that's what you get, you get a bowl, and you get a spoon, and he goes, go for it. What he's actually done is he's taken a very, very fine filament of an almost uh, transparent consomme of tomato and dill and put it into a film and just basically poured it into the soup. So you go through the whole motions of actually doing it, but as you come up, it will, as the heat of you through the spoon, it will start to melt the gel, you'll get the, the, the sense of tomato and gel, and you can actually drink it in there, it'll do that. So you actually get an empty thing, so he calls it nothing. But he's actually, oh my God, I'm just paying like 300 euros for this and I'm absolutely getting nothing. But, you're actually, yeah, but he has, he's created a, a sort of trick around that. And that's a dish called Rian, which again uses this um, concept of sensory um, congruency. Uh, this is another one which I liked was oyster in its shell. So this was WD50, which was one of the really cutting edge New York diners. So unfortunately it shut down. So the guy called Wiley de Fresne, he came up with some awesome stuff. This, is, this whole dish is completely edible, including the oyster shell. 
So what he did is he, from Margaret's, he um, basically got kaolin, which is the sort of the clay, and they took moulds of oysters, shells, and they basically painted them all up, and he created, so the whole dish is completely edible. But trying to convince people to start with the oyster shell and everything else, oh no, I can't eat that, I must do, I'm going to go into that as well, but he actually created a sort of substance around that. Why this sometimes happens as well is because we have this process of oral referral. Why we get some of these perceptions, why there's that biceptual flip and everything else around. As we know, we think we're actually tasting, but we're not. Uh, we're actually smelling. That retronasal element um, will actually come through. It's the food aromas. That as they resolve, as some of those, like the invisible gel, they're going to hit your tongue, they're going to warm, they're actually going to waft up, so you're not actually tasting those. Uh, it's the aromas that actually sort of create that. But the next question is, what do I do if I actually get the capacity? Can I still have this visual perception battle or trickery going on uh, if I actually remove the um, altogether? And the answer is yes. So that's a mojito cocktail done through spherification. Um, so that's one of the really classic, almost overborn now modernist techniques where you encapsulate using alginate and you get this very thin shell and you can do it. What we did, and it wasn't me, but it's a colleague of mine that as you work with, it does like a cocktail night with this, and you give these people mojitos, they can't smell it, and you've never seen people get drunk fast, that faster. Um, it's literally only like 10 mils, considering like normally 40 mils or 30 mils are in there, so it's almost 25% of a normal shot. But because they can't smell it, what I found, and, and we did it lots of times because it was quite giggly, um, the, because you can't smell it, you can't create an ex expectation about, oh my god, this is boozy or not boozy, so I'm going to sip it, I'll only have one. It was only when you burst into it, you got that hit. And because you don't have the uh, orthonasal and sort of stuff, you're not tasting it, you get the full retronasal alcohol blast. Everyone, almost we do this with, thinks that it's way more boozy than it actually is because they get all those really tonic alcohol flavors straight in, in almost a really impacted short hit, supercharged hit. Um, and again, it was really sort of interesting to see that. If you want to do it at home, there's the recipe for you. It's actually not that difficult. And you can do it with any cocktail you like. Um, but it's really interesting when you've, you want to try some of this stuff around, you start to remove some of those primary perceptional uh, sensors like sight and everything else around, and you can actually have some really fun, interesting techniques because people are full back on other senses that they wouldn't normally do because it's normally a process. You know, your entire sensory system and your entire body is all about keeping bad stuff out and good stuff in. That's why we have skin, that's why we taste, we see. We've got so many precautionary measures before I actually get something in my mouth, I can even still spit it out. Before I go the no-go decision, swallow it, there is so many um, psychological, physiological and physical actions that we go through to validate, that's it. So if we can, in a fun, safe environment, circumvent some of those, we can have Real, real bit of fun. But there is a strong trust element in there, and you can't push the boundaries too far. Yep. So sometimes we actually, that process will actually take some time, and this is what we call uh, a process called immersions. Uh, I said there was a little bit of philosophy around this, so this was really uh, a philosophical view, a psycho psychological view came from Germany. It was what it was trying to say, there's an awful lot of chaos out there in terms of everything else around. And what Gestalt is how the theory is about, if I look at it long enough, I can um, sort of resolve it in my head and actually create an or a semblance of order um, in my sense. So you might have seen, have you ever seen that Dalmatian dog in the snow photograph? That's a Gestalt one. You look at it, you look at it. You know, some of those photographs, you've got to stare at it and all, you'll see the unicorn in it. That's all using that theory. If I stare at it long enough, it looks all the discordant colours, but they'll eventually coalesce into an image I can actually recognise. And that's really the Gestalt theory. So, but... Uh, and again, this is an element they can actually sort of play with. So what if I do it if it's actually sort of physical in here? So here's an example what we mean. So this is, was created by a chef um, who I did. Uh, I contacted him and he was very kind enough to lend his time to when I was doing my thesis. A guy called Joseph Youssef in the UK. He did some work with, um, also with Charles Spence and also with Hessen at the Fat Duck. He was a chef there. So he created a dish like this. So that's what it looked like. And it was purposely looked, uh, basically, it, that was how it was presented to you. Um, on there. So I don't know anybody that's probably too hard. I know even Sophie might know this one. She's seen it enough times. Um, but if I do this now and pivot it around, does anyone see anything in there at the moment? And if I do that, and if I do that, it's Picasso. It's Picasso, yeah? So you can actually do it. So what they did is they presented it down as a visual perception. So it's the, the people that got it were the people on the opposite side of the table because they could see it. And then once it started, like, oh, there's something human, and then that's one of the most famous photographs of Picasso. They, it suddenly came out, suddenly emerged in there. 
So they actually create this whole process, and sometimes it actually took some minutes, but when actually people cottoned on, again, it's that hedonistic food challenge, everything else around, um, they're actually going for. Yep. What we're actually trying to do with this dish, the whole intention of it, uh, it, it illustrates the point, you know, a lot of gastronomy, what we're actually trying to do is, is about creating uh, a perception, and you know, a sense of enjoyment, a sense that it's going to be pleasurable, a sense that it's going to be measurable. Um, but what's nice with some of these techniques is that we can actually manipulate that perception, you know, and we can actually use that to heighten the experience and the sensation. Yeah. The challenge that we've got is certainly with vision, is that pretty much once you've got it, it's pretty much difficult to flip back again. Most of the people, once they've got that, if you ever see this, you instinctively get it. It's, it's again, because you know, you, as we showed earlier, that you know, it's specific around if your cortexing processing power is on, um, on video, and it will basically sort of log it in. But it doesn't mean that they're actually not trying to create those bistable processes in, in food in there. Because that would be really cool, is as you ate it, it, it was enabled, it flicked it back and forwards and things like that. So still a lot of research going into from that perspective. Yep. So that's probably a fairly specific, quite unique case. So what I want to talk about is really the concept of plating, because that's certainly people in school will be a lot more familiar with around, isn't it? Um, and one of the um, elements is why should we care? Because you know there is a, a bit of an obsession going on about plating and how we should plate and everything else around. But what they're actually finding is that it can actually pay off exceedingly financially well for organisations. So it shows that actually diners are willing to pay more for food uh, that's basically plated in a specific way. Okay, it might look the same and everything else around, taste the same, but it's, it's something about those connective um, orientations um, that people will actually pay for and represent more. And so a couple of reasons around that. Um, although it's quite interesting, I did speak to some of the chefs that, you know, sort of in there, that they were against sort of avant-garde plating to a certain extent because they felt, some of the customers said, the food just all looked the same. You know, you try to create differentiation by plating, whereas, you know, some of the viewers don't forget you create differentiation actually by the flavour and the taste of the food. So you can't forget the basics. Don't do this with bad food because it, the whole thing will fall down. So there was a, an experiment that they did. This is like very small. So it's, I want to say very small, up to about 500 people. But they did find, when they did this, a couple of things. So it does, that's basically how it's plated does make a, a difference um, on there. Uh, you know, the visual perception of the food, and I said not only their appreciation, the, the hedonistic, the aesthetic value of it, but how much they're willing to pay. Uh, and it was the top one that won um, on there. People liked straight lines uh, from there. Um, it's more, you know, we have a, a touch about it a bit more later, but they have a preference for oblique lines, apparently, going up to the right. Yep, over the other dishes around that. Um, so that's one, one element, but as you can see, it's not all there because the, the curd cheese you've got in the middle, again, it's got a little twist. So orientation um, is key to this as well. What you call a dish matters as well. So in the experiment, not, they did it in multiple ways, but not only did they do the plating, but they actually presented the dish. You know, one of the ones, you know, rather than actually just give it a, one was called Winter Futures with, you know, and it had a much more descriptive flowery sort of process. The other one was just sort of like apple crumble with curd in there. They actually found outside the orientation there is psychologically um, an impression where people responded more to more descriptive flowery element, but you can't go too far um, on that. If you go too much, people just tip off the other side as an example of that, of, of that later. Um, and diners basically do, um, on there, have an um, orientation. So in this experiment, tiny, tiny, you know, so a couple of hundred people, 61 degrees. So they actually got asked, they had the plated in the line and they had the plated in the center and they were asked to do this or actually visually click on a, a video screen and move it around. Um, and a statistically significant result was um, 61, uh, 61 degrees off the count. That's what basically resonated to uh, across that sample group. Which is really sort of interesting because, you know, if we're looking at it from an aesthetic position, you know, most people think aesthetics relate to art um, on there. It's like picture frames are like this. Yeah? But half of the plates sold in the world, and you can imagine how many of this, are all white and they're like that. 
um, and they just don't know why. And people will respond, they've done surveys with art and how they respond to art that's square lines and oblique lines and everything else around. So there's some visual simulation, there's straight lines, everything else give a surety and everything else around. Although don't do it in tables, square tables are seen as threatening. Couldn't, nobody likes corners like round tables, which doesn't make well for lots of covers um, on there. But there is a, also a view is that there is a sense on there that the, what they call visual saliency, that they feel that the, mo the food is more prominent. So as you can see, the, the curd is off to a slight degree. Um, on the gizmo, um, more prominence in there. There is a perception that they think they're actually getting more food, and therefore it's a high value for money. Um, and also, some of the research, because it's an oblique line going there, it's inherently a sense of motion or dynam uh, dynamicism is actually put in there, and people will respond to that aesthetically. Um, if they think sort of food is moving everything else around being static, again, people um, reward to do that. So that was some, it's quite small, but it was really quite illuminating, that sort of survey. But one of the other things is what they, um, what they care about as well, and obviously it's quite a lot. So uh, certainly when I go, most of the culinary schools I talk to, the chefs, you know, there is a view, um, which agree that odd, odd is to pursue a view about how many, if you're going to put something on a plate, um, three or five or, or one, everything else, it's to preserve wisdom about how many you should put on there. Interestingly enough, the research sort of debunked that a little bit. More, peop more people are actually interested in the total number of food. So four is better than three. Um, and that they, actually, you know, they actually sort of um, look for, it's that combination, the value for money element, and they're not necessarily worried about that sort of aesthetic element about even and odd numbers, um, which was quite interesting. It's not overtly sort of proven, but what they try to do is get a better seal on that. So, here is a, a dish that was done through crowd, uh, crowdsourcing on the internet. So literally thousands of people. So this is a signature dish by a Brazilian chef, Alberto Longev. Um, and it's a red onion, a tapioca, and a peanut dish. And what they did is they put it on the website, and people will basically, and he plated it like that. Um, and then people got to comment it um, on it to say, so literally uh, thousands and thousands of people, they reckon that 3.4 degrees just off the orientation was the perfect sort of result. And that he naturally plated it just slightly off kilter. Uh, so it was actually very close. We did quite well. But the, the resounding research sort of came back and said, um, no, we need, for some reason, people like to see it in off, off center. They don't like up and downs. And certainly triangles, if you do a triangle, don't have the point coming to you. If you can try a pasta dish, have the point away, because that, again, sharp edges, threatening. There's some sort of instinctive thing that people don't like pointy things pointing at them, even though it's a piece of ravioli. OK. So what we can also look at as well, um, they also did some research about like, this vogue about offset plating, um, you know, where you see it's actually around the edge of the plates rather than classically in towers. We had that whole generation of towered food and rounds of moulds and everything else around. But there is a role, and it's quite interesting because this, as a, a differentiator, quite a lot of those modernist dishes, as you can see here, are actually plated um, when it is round. Um, and the preferences don't do that. They don't like, people don't like unbalanced food. They like, and what we mean is balanced food is they want it basically in the middle of the plate. So and as you saw, so even though it's orientated and it's straight, it is symmetrically across the center of the plate. They didn't test it to one side, but the research of here would predicate if you did it to one side, you're not actually gonna get that uh, enjoyable um, element uh, from that. Which is again, really interesting. So um, there's a view that modernist techniques are doing this, and maybe it's actually more to be doing different because they're modernist chefs. Um, and it's actually, uh, from the research perspective, it's probably not the best way to go. Um, in this one instance, is go traditional. Keep it in the center of the plate uh, from there, or the slight orientation, and do left to right, and everything else, and you're happy days. Okay, so now we've actually talked about sight and everything else around. What I want to do is talk about some of the other higher senses. So this is about sound, as we talked about. So here is uh, ISO. So here is actually a government uh, standard around what defines a sound uh, from there. So as you can say, you know, it does talk about all the senses, really, but it doesn't really call out the importance of sound. Um, and then, which is really quite interesting, because again, like chefs like um, Hessen Blumenthal talk about it as an ingredient, sound as an ingredient. And they actively use it. So some of his stuff you can do at home, if you've ever seen of the Heston things, like popping candy is everywhere. He uses that for that realistic, you know, sort of sense if you take it, or the space dust, that, you know, sort of sensation, that extra hap haptory and sort of automatic, somatic sensory in, in your mouth as well, using that. Um, and part of, the, part of the buzz of rather the sensation is the sound that it'll actually sort of generate. If you're lucky enough to dine in Muggerets, where they're doing it, which is again, I think it's two Michelin star, but it's one of the rated. So this is a modern avant-garde Spanish restaurant. 
Again, one of the dishes you get is a porter, uh, mortar and pestle on the dish, and you actually have to pound it as part of the dressing on there, and everyone's going around. So apparently in the restaurant, when it all comes, because it's a degustation, it's a uh, place of menu, you know, all these bang, 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 people actually doing it, releasing aromas, but there's a sort of carthatic sort of, I'm actually involved in the cooking process, I'm actually in there doing stuff, curating part of this sort of experience, and they have that sort of one of those dishes around. Um, and we also talk about, you know, the, the sound, the importance, you know, at the ultraviolet when they, they had that sort of reconduction of the, the um, fish and chips on the beach and everything else around. And they found that um, sound can actually have quite a specific experience when they intensify it um, on there. So the classic one they did is oysters. So this is an experiment. So people ate oy oysters and they had some um, sort of seagulls flying around and people... Actually, in, in the, the research actually came out, these oysters taste more oystery and sort of stuff in there. The, that perception or the memory elements of putting somebody in a specific place, which is part of the story that they tell, is emphasized. And again, it accentuated the brininess and the, and the saltiness uh, of, the actually, of the go. But interestingly enough, um, there is a classic dish, you know, the sounds of the sea that I talked earlier. So if you actually get, and you can download that soundtrack, it was um, geared towards a, made from a British beach, so it's waves crashing on a pebble beach, and it's very nostalgia for Brits and everything else around. Talking to the chefs at the Fat Duck when they're down there, they started to do that, and the dish was a bit of a bust, because all these Australians went, that's not what a beach sounds like, because it should be water on sand, because that's completely different. So they actually changed the, the soundtrack to actually get that evocative meaning. It was so embedded into the dish and towns of it is that you can actually go the other way and they found quite quickly, they went, oh, we never actually considered that not all beaches sound the same and we need to make it culturally and geographically uh, sensitive. So that was really quite interesting to say, you know, because they, they've made a fortune on that dish. And it's quite interesting, it doesn't work all the time in all the places. Okay. What we also have as well is that, you know, you've got this whole thing about sound in terms of um, auditory cues, in terms of uh, the background, in terms of music playing and packaging that it actually sort of looks like, the preparation of food and how it's been uh, sort of eaten uh, from there. Um, there was quite an interesting uh, study done um, in the 90s as well about can food influence, you know, what you eat. So they did cafeterias and they played Italian food and sure enough everyone went off to pasta and they played Mexican food and everyone went tacos. And they had a, an, a sale in a supermarket where they played French music or German music um, to see how that influenced people's behaviour. And it's quite interesting, when they played French music, people predominantly bought French wine. When they played German music, um, they basically bought German wine. And even though they empirically could tell what was paying when the, guy, when the people actually purchased the wine, most of the respondents in there categorically denied that the music influenced their decision. No, no, no. Part of them weren't even aware the music was playing at all when they got asked. Uh, but all the stats is because they know when the music was playing, when the registers rolled up and everything else around. So it, it does subliminally can add to affect what you do. But what about the sound of sort of food um, in its own right? So if we look at um, some of these. Yep. So this is about, you know, because of the sound of the crunch. So did the experiment, can I affect what something tastes like by changing the sound of it? And the answer is yes. If I actually change basically the volume and some of the, the frequency of there, I can actually sound, make something sound even 15% more crunchier. And they did this. They did it. This guy got an award. It was all on Pringles. The nice thing about Pringles is every Pringles the same. So it makes for a scientific result really, really easy. Um, but a lot of the respondents wouldn't believe it. They thought they were eating crisps from, or, you know, or chips from different, basically, manufacturers in there, but they were all the same types of Pringles sort of in there. They actually uh, went through the whole process and, and um, created this cross-modal effect by, obviously, having um, a microphone and basically sort of feeding it back. Um, and again, and unlike this one, um, it works every time. It's not like the emergent sort of stuff. Once you find it, you will, if you, if you play the frequencies back, you'll get this enhanced effect of crunchiness each time. Um, and why they think it does is, it's, again, it's that sort of little primeval sort of element. Crispy cells, because they think crispy equals fresh equals more nutrients. So there's a sort of biological historical driver around that. Um, and also the sonic cues we're actually going for as well. So also crisp tends to suggest some of these flavors since the um, suggests the elements or the sense of fat in there. Fat is food, um, the survival sort of content. While soggy food, nobody likes soggy 
crisps and everything else around. Intuitively, they, again, it goes back to the aversion thing, but that's because it's not nutritionally beneficial. Most of the things, you know, people, wilted lettuce and everything else around, people will not be sort of attracted around that. And as we can see, some are distinctly, so there's uh, Escoffier uh, in there, and one of his things was for Dame Melba, was the Melba toast. So that's almost, uh, you know, one of those things. He actually took a piece of crunchiness and made it even more crunchy. Um, by splitting it and, and sort of toasting it. So even back in the, whatever it was, 1880s when he sort of developed it, he's actually applying on these principles of just increasing the, the head and element of it um, by doing it. And we can, you can do that in two ways. One of the things you can actually do it by just changing the rustling of the packaging. So some of the, the work that's been done, if I can make a packet more rustly as I put my hand in it, I will actually instinctively think it's fresher and crispier and anything up to 5%. But the, what the real sort of um, killer on that is 15%. If I can actually get that audio feedback, um, I'll actually do that. One of the nice things as well is for Snapple, this drink. Um, Snapple's brand name was all about freshness and everything else. And to preserve that, um, they used to sort of shrink wrap the, uh, the top of the bottle. And it was all good because they had, you twisted it and it went pop and everything else. And that was part of the, as you can see in there, that was part of the marketing gimmick in there. What they actually did is re-architected the pop, the sound of the pop. So instinctively override, um, basically, oh, this must be fresh because it has the resonance and the frequency of a really fresh pop. What that allowed them to do is eliminate 180 million meters of plastic wrapping that they did every year because they didn't need to then shrink wrap or basically put it on, on top. So just by playing simple things like that, you can actually, actually uh, achieve quite, a, quite an interesting effect. So the next thing is that you actually talk about is um, what about the bubbles? You know, so a lot of things, this is actually not sound. Um, we actually talk about the sound of bubbles on the tongue. Uh, it's actually not the sound. What you're actually doing is activating the sour receptors um, on your tongue, but it's actually cross-modally picking up, um, and that fizz and anything else is actually done through uh, the sound. You're actually activating the sound centers. But it's interesting that sound um, can actually be employed to create and enhance a sense of creaminess, or what they call mouthfeel um, in the products as well, just by the frequencies that they actually use. Um, but it's not only just about that. So there's the visuals. You know, most people, you know, really do not like being in a loud restaurant because it interferes with the dining experience, which is all around sharing a meal and, and the commerciality and the sociability of it. But if you actually get upset to a certain degree because it's loud, that will attack, basically um, affect how you perceive the food. But they also found is that the background noise. So if you actually like the music tracks um, on there, you will actually find the food a little bit sweeter. And if you dislike, you'll actually start to introduce some bitter notes into the, into the food, depending on your attraction levels around the music. Yeah? Um, and it will affect you know, the hedonic rating that we've actually done that. We've got this concept, they call it sonic seasoning. Um, this is an experiment that I have done, um, where you get a little sweet, you pass it around, we don't have time tonight. Um, uh, and then you play some different, basically, music um, on there. So you get people take a bite and you'll play some low tones. Um, in there, um, and people will think, oh, it's a little bit bitter, and you can compensate. You say, take, bite the other half, and people think it's another sweet, you play high tones, and for a number of people, it'll actually be sweeter. Now, again, this is not a universal rule, but it's a majority rule in there. So there is certain, there was a restaurant that had, when you got to the dessert, they actually gave you a phone on the desk, and it said, dial four for sweet, or dial, or, you know, and you did it, and they played you some thing, and you went to dessert, or you said, you know, if you want to make it a little bit bitter, dial zero for bitter, and you played a bitter tone. Um, and actually did that. It's a bit of a gimmick, but they're trying to actually do this sort of sonic seasoning. There was also a, a study around background music and how it tasted on wine. Um, so they did this thing where they got people, in the, you know, the old goon bags, um, and drank the wine and they played different music. And there was a correlation between the beats of the music and everything else around, um, and also how people actually registered the wine on that. Um, the other thing is, is, for those people running in restaurants and stuff, you can actually accelerate the pace of the meal. So by putting a more kicky pack sack, people logically eat faster. So if you, you're up for cover rotation, that's a great way of doing it. But again, you don't want to make it so it breaches into the uncomfortable and intrusive, but subtly you can do it. It's shown that people actually um, eat a, a little bit faster. Okay. Oh, so we go on here. But what about um, the food that's actually been paired? So there's, there's a chef here that, that's... Um, no, so this is Massimo Batoma. He's a three-star Michelin chef uh, out of there. So this is about sound, about it. For him, it's a massive sort of trigger. Um, and this is a little video I've got here called The Crunchy Part Of. Listen. Yeah. What are you doing? So just the sheer process, the sounds of creating it are so evocative for him.
which is all the intensive ingredients and taste of lasagna. So this is the deep fried um, lasagna sheets, as you can see with, um, with bechamel in there and, and a basil reduction, which they've then toasted on a bit of blow torching, because what's modern cooking without the blowtorch? And then a spuma. There you go. There you go. Okay, so what, um, what does gastrophysics tell us about um, basically um, taste as well? So in this section, it's a very, you know, because of the whole taste and smell and everything else, so I've, I've sort of combined um, those together and I would call it taste, smell and mouthfeel because they, are, they all come together. Um, and, and really, as I said, 75 to 95% of what we typically think we are tasting, uh, we're actually smelling. Um, you know, our ability to smell, differentiate smell, is so phenomenally more over-exact. As I said, the olfactory bulb is part of the extension of, uh, into the brain. It's a very short wire, so we are, even though from a uh, processing capability, it's relatively low down, get some visual, but it's incredibly uh, important. Um, and also... The smell as well, it goes into the olfactory system as well, but it's hardwired into the limbic system. Limbic system's all about memory. That's that memory triggers and everything else around why it's so important. Um, and again, so we're actually going to talk about flavour in this sort of section, but it's sort of smell and the taste and the mouthfeel because they're all important. So the mouthfeel is the creaminess and the lushiness about it, even the crispiness and the crunchiness, how it affects um, as we eat it. And the chemisthetis as well. So what the chemisthetis is, is the nerve impulses. So we have the trigeminal nerve, in there that plays a pain. So you eat chili, you are not tasting chili, you're actually in pain. That's, it's, it's, that's the chemisthesis in there. Uh, it's also, you might have um, certain like menthol and everything else around. Menthol produces that cold section because it actually is producing a nerval response um, in there. Sparkling water. Yep, sparkling water as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, that will do that as well. Um, and one of the elements is if the temperature, ambient temperature gets below 15 or above 55, your body registers that as pain. Um, in there. So that, the chemesthetic process is really important in terms of flavour and, and it's one that is quite often sort of overlooked. So, you know, a lot of this, we talk about flavour, these are the things, olfactory and retronasal, so this is as we smell, we've got the, the taste sensors on there, uh, but again as we release those tastes, we're actually, as we swallow them, they'll go up the back of the nose um, on there, that's important. So why this is sort of in, uh, important and they can be different, so if we actually look at the cup of coffee, this is probably leads to one of the biggest disappointments because you, you brand it and you can smell it and it smells awesome and everything else and you actually taste it and it tastes awful, it doesn't taste like that at all. Because what you're actually doing, you're creating a perception um, and you bring in orthonasally and stuff and quite happens, particularly if you've got a lot of saliva in your mouth, it will actually dampen some of those flavoids down and retronasally, you're actually getting more bitter notes and everything else around you, you're smoothing it out. Um, now manufacturers, again, food producers do, will actually compensate. There was a vogue of actually putting in those airtight cans, of actually putting coffee aroma in. So the first thing in the morning, you crack the can and you fill it up and create this expectation, and then you end up with a cup of really, really <coughs> awful coffee. Um, so it's on that. So again, that's really important. So we talked about the, the flavour, the, the chemisthesis of there as well, and we have these tastes, you know. Everyone talks about five tastes, you know, you know Nami, as we talked about with the tomato juice sort of in there. Um, but now we're talking about, you know, is, does it stop at five? Does it top, top at six? You know, there's some view basically around there that we could be up to 20 individual tastes. Now, the definitive rule um, of this is that if we don't have a dedicated taste receptor in, uh, on our tongue, then in theory it doesn't, is not qualified as a taste so on there. So there are, some, some of the stuff is, is out, they're talking about, you know, starchy, you know, we've got a, an attraction to that because I love the carbohydrates. There's other elements around, there's about the fatty elements from, from meat and everything else around. That's, you know, a um, somatosensory sort of experience, but it's, it's part of uh, that whole mouthfeel, but it's not necessarily a, a sort of taste in there. Carbonated drinks have a metallic taste, some people talk about that as a, as a distinctive element, or even no taste at all. 
So one of the, the ones that has come out, um, they're actually talking about, is Kakumi. Um, in there, so you've got the five basic tastes, and as you go up, then you've got your flavor aroma. So this is one of the new ones. It's more of a mouth feel, um, and it's associated with richness and lusciousness and everything else around. So current thing is like garlic um, and onions and scallops all possess this uh, quality as well. Um, so it's not sort of cut and dried, but to give you an idea of basically how important it is, uh, as part of my sort of research, I actually found from the Department of Defense in the US a paper called Olifaction Warfare, uh, and it's titled Odor as a Sword and Shield. And it's not making this up. It's a 50-page paper that goes in how to make, for the Department of Defense in the US, odor bombs. Because one of the things they're finding, and they did this experimentation of trying to find one or two universal odors that everybody hated. And the difficult news is there is no universal odor that everyone finds repulsive. Yeah, and again, it's culturally unorientated. They even took the most obscene sort of sanitary and toilet wastes and everything else and thought, this is it, this has to be the silver bullet on there. But no, there's apparently people that just not exactly love it, but can live with it. Um, so as a war, part of war, you know, uh, warfare weapon, it's still going on, but it's so instinctively aversive or sort of attractive that they actually are spending millions of dollars trying to come up. Because obviously, you know, long-term effects that, you know, neurological, I don't want to go down, down that path in there, but as you can see, it is a very powerful implementer in terms of attraction, you know, and to the extent that they are investing a lot of money. So we're actually talking about that. So we talked, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, we eat with our eyes, whether in the visual context. So, we can, you know, one of the things is, can you actually taste the colour? Um, so this was a restaurant. This was an experiment. So again, this is our friend Yusuf Ali. He runs a website, Kitchen Theory, really, really interesting. Uh, he does these synesthetic meals and everything else where he, he creates these experiences based on that. So he presented this dish and said, you know, which one's the sour one, which one's the bitter one, which is the salty one, and which is the sweet one. Um, and, then he, and he basically has a three, four minute video. Um, and you'll be glad to know that most people get it right. And I bet you sort of did, sort of on there. You know, most people will say sweet, you know, basically the sweet one's going to be red, white, sort of salt. So it must be on there, dark is bitter, and green instinctively. So instinctively, you, again, we talked about the concept of perception. You're already actually on that game. You're already halfway to that point. So again, you can actually do this. This is a concept called sensory dominance, where you know, you're eating multi-sensory, you're taking all this information, but your body will naturally gravitate to the central information that it thinks it's, that basically is most important or is going to give you the best influence. Um, and you'll find that. So you'll find in super tasters that they will be less reliant on visual and more on tasting, whereas non-super sensors will err towards the visual, which is why it's not necessarily 100% in there. Um, but typically, one of the sensors will be uh, more dominant. You know, they can find if you add more red, um, that things basically become a little bit sweeter. Um, well, blue and green colors decrease um, sweetness perception, etc. And some of it, they can actually change. So they did a, an experiment where all that they did is change the packaging. I think it was Listerine. So Listerine was traditionally blue, and it's now, I think, you can get an orange. And there was an upcry because people think they'd reformulated it, and people said it tasted different. It's exactly the same. It was in there. They just associated yellow with a bit sweeter. And all they'd done is change the packaging. Um, to actually do that, you know. uh, and again, there was a, a, an experiment they did with Tropicana, that fruit drink. So they basically made the color deeper. Um, on the orange and deeper, and people said, oh, it got more orangey, when in fact it didn't, because they were just changing the colour of it. And interestingly, when they added more sugar, people just didn't pick that up at all. So it got sweeter and sweeter, and people said, no, this is fine, no change. But the mere inflection of colour actually produced a, a more intensive orangey flavour. So this is the, the one I actually sort of quite like. So um, around sound, so psychology, this, one of the psychologists came up with two words called booby, booba and kiki. Okay, and people implicitly said, well, booba is a roundy word, so that must be fluffiness and marshmallowy and everything. And kiki is sort of hard and edgy and sort of stuff. You can just imagine it, you know, the, the implications. So they've created some sort of experiments where they basically put people, they actually created a dish called booba and kiki. Um, and instinctively, people thought booba was sweeter and this and kiki because the hard edges was bitterer and everything else. They found with chocolate, you put sharp edges on chocolate, people were bitterer. So Cadbury's um, had this experiment where they reformulated, they didn't reformulate it, they changed the description to um, an element of the bottom. So you see how the bottom one is a bit more rounded uh, in there. Um, and people went crazy for it because they actually, because it was rounder, they got the booba effect and actually thought it was creamier and richer. It's exactly the same formulation. 
Um, so there was a different one. So not only did they get a win on the product because people thought they were getting more for the money, they actually had, they even put, ended up putting less chocolate in the bar because you can see they rounded off all the corners. So they're actually getting more bigger bang for the buck and actually um, producing a less important thing. So you know the sort of the shape of it, your sort of perceptions is uh, really really important uh, on there. Um, and there's a, there's a classic experiment as well. There's a, a French guy, Pruchet, that you'll hear about. This is the one where he got a, a couple of uh, 54, um, basically wine students, something else, and he gave them white wine and he dyed it red. And they just went off the charts. Um, and said, oh, this is random. This is all the, all the characteristics of red wine and everything else around. And they were just cheap. And I don't, don't even know what the wine was. It was a white wine. It was just basically dyed red. And um, they just described it basically as a red wine. And even when they told them, no, it's white wine, we just dyed red. They just still could not basically break away. The, the association, because they'd spent so long with wine, the association was so hardwired into the bread, they just couldn't flick back and, and connect because their view, they saw red wine and instinctively all the memory came about, oh, I, I'm sniffing it, it must be this, and they're just pulling for all these, these, visual, uh, the, these memories about wine connotation and completely, uh, completely um, blown away. So it's a really interesting study. It's been a bit hackneyed now, but it really gives you a sense of the visual dominance and what you're expecting. So, in terms of plate colour, so they've got a frozen um, strawberry mousse and they put it on a plate. Um, and they put it on a white plate and they put it on a black plate. And the white plate, people actually recommended, they said it's um, basically it's 10% um, sweeter and 50% more flavourable rather than putting on the black plate. Exactly the same, different colour plates. And then if you then change the shape of the plate, so rounder food, um, round plates make for a sweeter uh, exception as well. Again, it's a, I think it's the boober effect. You know, sharp plates, star shapes, everything on. People just think that. They're in instinctively actually going to do that. Um, orange makes chocolatey taste more chocolatey. Uh, so it's on that front. So, you know, classic one, Cadbury's egg, you know, the, you know sort of the um, egg dessert. You know, quite often you'll actually get orange-flavoured stuff and it'll be wrapped in orange paper and everything else around. <laughs> <coughs> and one of the interesting as well is doing, as I said, some of the wider societal benefits. The time with age, um, aged people as well, they go off their food and everything else around because they find it dull. So we're actually playing around, it's playing with the colour of, of plates because it will create a different visual contrast to the food um, in there. So they found some of the success around blue plates um, in um, aged care facilities as well because it creates uh, a different contrast and therefore it ignites a bit of enthusiasm, a different sort of perception basically around that. So again, um, it can go. So, okay, so that's four. Um, so what we're actually going to do then and go to is about touch. So here we have the burger, um, and as a view, it would, you know, would a burger taste as good as it is if you ate it with a knife and fork? Um, and the view is probably not, because part of that experience, part of the exception flow, is you want it in your hands and everything else around. And there's actually been a lot of research into the optimum height you can have to open your mouth and everything else around about the optimal sort of the experience. But a lot is keyed in is about tapping into the haptic nature of that food, um, and it's really quite important. So there's a lot of the research is going on about how. How is it when we touch something, how does that affect um, our food experience around that? So we know, you know, if I eat from a heavier bowl or a cutlery, it actually tastes. So people's perception of the food is of a higher quality. Did an experiment, same yogurt, heavier bowls. All the research said they put it in a heavier bowl and people thought it was a much lich, um, richer, luscious, more yogurt than in there. Exactly the same yogurt. It also lends for the traditional thing about heavy cutlery and plating and crystal and everything else in a restaurant because we uh, instinctively associate that heaviness and that weight um, with um, quality as well. And why it's also important is that you know, a third of everything that we eat these days in, in uh, modern worlds and stuff is basically is out of a wrapping as well. So how it's wrapped is really important. That haptic element um, in, you know, in terms of you know, the sandwich or whatever it is, is a, is a really important plate. Um, and we know that that's actually mirrored, so the weight um, so there was an experiment here, and in fact this is used, as, um, this came from the UK, where they were actually adding weights of glass, so making the bottles heavier, and they were actually able to charge a premium. And I think it was a, a pound more for every 10 grams of glass they were putting into the bottom. Because people typically, you know, when you, don't, you, know, when you go to uh, an off-license stuff, you actually pick up the bottle and quite often heft it, and then we go, so go, oh, that's good value. And they do the associating hev heaviest sort of quality around that. Um, and again, it's, it's mirrored in glasses, and everything else around. Um, and again, it's that, and they know um, it's around being able to correlate that to a price tag. Um, holding the bowl is really important as well. Um, you'll actually eat less if you hold the bowl. So eating standing up is, is perceived to be uh, better for you. 
um, and you'll actually sort of eat, uh, eat less around of it. You'll also eat more slowly and also your satiety, how quickly you fill full, uh, will happen faster if you're actually holding, holding the bowl. If the bowl is heavier as well, then you get the added kick that you think it's, it's of high quality um, around that. The saying when you hold it, um, you also, if you think something is a bit crunchy or has a nice firm surface, you'll actually enjoy it more. And they did a, an experiment where somebody, believe it or not, got a whole lot of stale pretzels and cut them in half and got a lot of fresh ones and actually stuck the two together and did an experiment where people ate it holding the stale end and people ate it in the French, the front, uh, you know, the, but on the stale end. They actually found if you ate the stale end but were uh, holding the fresh end, you didn't actually get, you basically overcompensated your brain, circumvented the sogginess factor and you actually thought it was actually a fresh pretzel. Um, so you can actually do it around, um, and it's fresh and fresh. So, so you know, the, the, there is something very, very important about the haptic nature uh, of what we actually get through from there. Um, they also found, you know, the surfaces of stuff. You know, they've lined it in terms of they'll touch something with a crunchy or a smooth surface and, and how it affects it, you know. Um, one of the things is they found, you know, touching something softer made uh, wine sweeter. So this is, as you imagine, how sweet, basically, the wine coming out of this. This is... Um, Murat's Oppenheim's 1936 modernist thing, which is uh, an element, which is a, you know, um, on that element. But actually find there's a, there's a report, so Charles Spence talks of a dinner party he went to where the chef, he did, because it's part of the research they have these dinner parties, cooked rabbit pie, and he wraps the cutlery in the, in the skin of the rabbits as well. So as an, and he actually did say, yeah, it was a bit freaky, um, but once he got over that, it did sort of accentuate the silky, haptic nature and everything else sort of coincided. One of the dishes now at Heston is the sort of one with its perfumes. Um, it's a sort of pink dish as well, and it comes, they've got like little, um, they've got um, like fur on the end of the spoons and everything else around, um, and it's an element to actually put into this. So, um, but one of the things is, is this is not necessarily a, um, a regular trend. So if you look here, there's a futurist cookbook. So um, Manoretti came up with this idea, the futurists. So this whole thing about, you know, a Rome and something else. So this predates from the 1930s. By political activity, Manoretti was not a particularly nice guy. He was a big fan of um, Mussolini. He was very nationalistic, very fascist. Uh, he was one of the guys that tried to ban pasta from Italy, so you imagine he wasn't particularly well liked anyway. So he's pretty much out there, odd guy. But one of the things he came up with is the Futurist Cookbook. So as you can see some of this stuff, diabolical roses, red roses battered and deep fried. This, he was the guy that had to sit there and was the first one that came out with the Romans. You would eat this, you know, sort of stroking um, this sort of heavy cube while somebody sort of wafted you um, and sprayed aromas over you, um, you know. And um, it was pretty sort of out there, but this is like 1930s, well, and this is 90, 80, 90 years ago. He was sort of coming up about how we can engage uh, with these sort of multi senses on there. Um, and again, uh, one of the elements they actually sort of take to it, the Manoretti had this sort of weird sort of rubbed velvet sandpaper glovey thing he created, where you sort of rubbed and touched, and as you got squirted, it was all really quite surreal. Um, but some of the elements come, so Yosef did this taste menu, so he created a dish um, on there, and it's got grilled paneer in it, um, on there, and it's served with some pickled and mushrooms, I'm just reading this, some bulgweek and bacon, but what it does is that you don't get salt and pepper with it, you get a, what he calls a condiment cube, so it's silky on one side and uh, rough and scrapey on the other, um, and what you do is you eat it, and you can flick around, and you sort of rub, rub your fingers around it. Um, and you're, as you eat this, you're invited to rub this cube. And it does, everyone that eats this does report back, it actually morphs the flavour. So the rough areas increases the bitter notes, and the sweetness, and the, the, the silkiness of the, the silk and the, and the, the fur side um, actually does make things a little bit softer and a little bit sort of sweeter. Um, you can sort of apply around it. Okay. But one of the elements around, he said, what, you know, some of the trends now at the moment, what happens if you don't get cutlery at all? So this has been a bit of a trend at the moment. You know, eating with your fingers, you didn't have things strung on little wires, everything else around. Again, it's trying to engage you a little bit of the primal instincts uh, to like sort of fully engage with this one as well. This one here is a dish that I actually created, um, which was uh, using uh, those sort of edible potato starches um, in there, which you can do this with vanishing dishes. And what it was was a... Um, uh, I call it popcorn ravioli, and it was a whole lot of ravioli, so it's like salted popcorn in there with a touch of caramel, but it was all encapsulated in these um, uh, edible, uh, basically, films, and the way you did it is you dipped them in melted warm butter, and you put it on the tongue, and it, the, basically the moisture then dissolved it, and you got the popcorn taste. But what I was trying to do is actually said, if, if I want to have something that's an unusual dish, and I actually ask you to use your hands to eat it, but I remove your ability to discern what those flavours are by wrapping it in a, in, a, in a sort of disc in there. You can only get the sense of it when you actually sort of do it. And 
Interestingly enough, it was probably the, the most uh, liked dish on there just for the novelty factor, but it just sort of surprised people and everything else around. How you can, you know, even when they do that, if you can actually start to play around with what we did, similar to some of the sensory incongruity stuff, you start to play around or remove your ability to use some of these sensors. Okay. Um, so one of the things is, is we actually sort of talked about from there, so what, what about the here and now? How do I, can I actually make everything more memorable um, on there? So, you know, there is a little bit of um, view about, well, it's all about the food. So great food creates great memories. And that, that's true to a certain degree, but our brains can't actually encapsulate a whole meal um, on there. There's just not enough processing power or storage to actually do that. We can only remember specifics. The peaks and the troughs, what was good, what was bad. So we actually condensed the whole experience and we're looking for sort of outliers to actually um, recollect. So when we remember it, oh, it was good or bad. So very, you know, so it's very difficult to remember a complete end-to-end -end exper uh, experience uh, because that's not how your brain works. So one of the things of doing it uh, from there um, is what, what can I do? How can I create, obviously you want to create peaks, you want to avoid the troughs, but how can I have that breaking in that memory chain to leave something memorable? Because me you know, memories do last, particularly of sort of um, flavor. Um, you know, they don't actually last very long, and that's why a lot of taste testing fails. Um, people do that, they taste it, and when they go out, they don't buy it, because they don't remember. So what you're actually trying to do is trying to um, tap into. Wine experts are a little bit ding because they're so focused on there, you know, they're creating, you know, what they're actually doing is they're having a sort of packing event where they're, they're packing down memories, they look at a wine, they know it's there, and they're sort of recalling all these memories instantaneously, and then they do that just through long training and everything else around. But what we can do from a chefing point of view and everything else around uh, is the sort of the concept of stiction, um, where what we're actually doing is we're creating these highs and lows. Some of them will do that, so this is um, a linear menu, where they're actually doing it through bridging flavors and everything else around. Um, this is the menu, um, as I said, I refer to that I actually did. As you can see, the ravioli one. I did this meal four and a half years ago, and I asked any of the people there, all they remember is the ravioli, which is fine, because uh, I thought the rest of it was okay, but they still talk about it. But that was in the middle, so I created a disruptive point in the middle, um, and they actually sort of do that. Um, and as we talked about, you know, you want to end the meal on the high. Um, so this is a linear one where they actually come, this is a Vogue, where they come and make the dessert on the table. They actually spoon it out and actually continue, you actually eat it off the table. So it's incredibly memorable on there. Um, one of the things you can do is around the wording, as we talked about, people respond to the, the wording, but you don't want to go overboard. So, you know, there was a prevalence of having, what, 63 degrees eggs on the menus and all this sort of stuff around, which is tipping it over the other element as well. So we want to be in instructive and everything else around. Um, but the interesting thing is around is that even though we want to be um, a little bit disruptive to create these sort of flows and everything else around, we still expect food to be in a certain order. So we have the entrees, we have the mains, we have desserts in there. And that's still a vague that we tend to sort of stick to as well. They also found some of the restaurants that just try to go well over the top and just be so different and everything else around invariably failed. And they found that is, as much as people want to be engaged and have a, another memory and stuff, they, there's a, a sort of paradoxical swift. They like the familiar as well. They like an element of comfort. So some of these menus and some of the longevity ones are dishes that people relate to with their familiar memory, but have a different dimension and sort of perspective. When you're just out there all the time, um, it invariably you know, doesn't, doesn't actually work. So we've actually talked about the, um, for the in terms of, uh, is there a downside? Um, so as you can see, this sort of visual perception, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit because of the interest of time. But as you can see, Nouvelle Cuisine started it and everything else around. And we're now in the age of Snapchat and Instagram and everything else around. So they reckon about 40% of all the meals now in the world are actually photographed. Um, some actually embrace it. So this dish at the end is from an Israeli restaurant. They have actually got a stand for you to put your iPhone in to get the optimal. Um, yeah, believe it or not, some of them actually do have little iPhone stands you can do. Some of them actually have down lighting to have you the optimal lighting. There's also some chefs that now actually have no Instagram. When on the menu, they have actually have little icons now that says, you cannot take photographs of this food. Um, there was a famous article came out, so you want to do it. It was um, Alexander Guthier um, came out. So he actually has Instagram item and a big red line through it said, thou shalt not take photographs of my food. Okay. So one of the things is, okay, this thing, how far can it go? So have you ever heard of mukbang? So this is this craze that came out of uh, Korea where people basically just pay lots of money to watch people eat food. Um, and it's a growing trend. So this lady here earns 9,000 US a month doing this program, this cable channel in there. So it's really hooking, and they think it, it started in Korea because of the social elements and the commonality in the break, but they, they find that people are actually going in there because 
it's replying a missing element because of this whole thing about, you know, like in the UK, a third of people, one in three people actually live in the, by themselves now in the UK. So they've broken this chain of sociable dining. They think it's a bit of a missing lack, link back to this element. But also, it's those people that are on these sort of diet cycles and everything else around, and there is an inadequacy or missing element of the food chain. So they're, they're hooking basically into this um, to actually get some sort of satiety around it, which is, but this is now, you go, like you Google this, it's gone crazy. Um, and, uh, and it's big, big business, big business. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, we are. Yep, okay. Three minutes. Okay, so we'll just quickly go through this. This is about food porn. There is some elements around that. Um, food technology um, will actually go. So now they're actually looking at some of the elements around um, food in terms of you know, uh, visual, AR, multi-sensory stuff. So here's a bit of cutlery around that actually shifts the center of gravity, so affects the quality and the weight of it. Um, here's another one as well. So there's AR, so you put an AR headset on, uh, and you can actually affect the firmness and the texture. You can do this with green food as well. Surprise, surprise, this is all coming from Japan. Uh, they're big on this. This is another one with the edge of tableware as well. So this is a fork that talks to you uh, and encourages. And you found it's got kids that will like food. They do a cup as well. I do have a video, which I'm not going to play. Um, and in there, uh, you can actually Google it. So you've got to go, yeah, go and find this. This is just the most bizarre thing in there. Um, this is just reinsert. So for those that know Kadinsky, this is a modern picture. And what they did is that they created a meal on those elements and said, do you like it more or less? And what they found is that when it was in a parallel of the artwork, people enjoyed it more, they thought it tasted better, they actually paid more from it as well, rather than the regular or the, or the presentation. And what this led them to believe, as some of the chefs is, is that what they're now thinking about is, it's not necessarily what's on the plate and it's how it's presented, but can you influence the exact combination of flavours you and how you want people to do? Because you can create a completely different dining experience, you know, because some people will eat all the red, then all the blue, then all the green, but if you actually can influence people to eat the food in a combinating sequence, you can actually create a different flavour profile as you go through the meal. So some of the, some of the look at how do I actually do that? How do I control how people eat? Because once it's on the plate, it's, it's pretty much fair game, you know, you can't control that would be a very weird restaurant uh, if they actually told you. The most I've said, I think, is some of the fish restaurants that say, here it is, it's perfectly cooked. So start at the thin filleted end because the heat transference, by the time you get to the thick end, it will all be perfectly cooked. That's probably about the most instructive element. Actually saying what order you can eat food is probably going to step too far, but certainly under consideration. Uh, and the last one in there, so this is a guy called David Muzef. So um, he's probably one of the most out guy there. You can read that for yourself some awesome stuff. So that's the, um, the dessert there is a smoked um, eel and salmon sandwich with some chipotle mayonnaise. This is called the pink panther tube, which is all edible. It's got mousses in there. I don't know what he calls the sperm dessert, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, pretty eye-catching. It's some sort of velvet mousse. And I couldn't actually find out what it's called, but it's in there. Uh, and that's his view. You know, they're in there. There's a one-to-one -one ratio between uh, waiters and staff. Uh, in there, and there's, there's basically 30 dishes. He has this concept of um, what he called canvases. So that's probably one of the most avant-garde guys that's really, really sort of playing out there. Um, and he's, he just, this was for me just recently, opened, uh, last year opened in London. Okay, so hopefully, um, start had to speed up in a minute. So hopefully that shared a little bit of where the research is, what it's done, how it's been used, how it can be used, how it all comes together, how a little bit of about um, sort of insight in terms of how technology is, and um, what some of the future tends around that. Um, so thank you for your time, um, and it's okay. How are you going to divide this up in your online course? Yeah, so the, the online course is four segments. So the idea at the moment is to give you a, a view, basically, of the history of it, how it came about, because some of these techniques, multi-century stuff, uh, you know, you can go into, there's a famous uh, portrait of, like, the unicorn and everything else, which talks about the taste, which is in a French gallery, so that's from the 1500s. You know, 40 blackbirds baked in a pie is an actual multi-century gift from the Middle Ages. So it would be the history all the way through the trends. Module two will be an introduction to the science behind it and uh, hopefully some combinations with some of the, the science. Module three will be about the chefs and where they're going. Um, and module four about what the future trends are likely to look like on the, on the back. So yeah, that's I what think, the four I modules think, look like. Um, I found that there's a lot to take away if you actually have your own restaurant or you're working <coughs> as a chef. Um, I think there was lots, lots there to, to consider. And, and lots to take away. So I hope everyone really enjoyed their time with Neil tonight and if we can just put our hands together again for Neil. Thank you. Thank you.